Mr. John Romani Mahama, former president of Ghana and the leader of the opposition National Democratic Congress, welcome to the Voice of America. Welcome to Washington. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Thanks for having me. Um, Mr. Mahama, we'll start out with what brings you to Washington, what brings you to the United States? Um, I'll make a quick correction first. I'm former president and um, the leader of our party is the chairman of the party. What happens is when we um, are in opposition, uh, the leadership reverts to the chairman of the party. So um, I came to, at the invitation of Liberty University, so I just flew in from Lynchburg where the university is. Um, I came to participate in the 500 CEO summit and uh, I also had the opportunity to address convocation of the university and then also participate in a program they've introduced uh, about doing business in Africa where they bring uh, b African business people and leaders to talk with American business people about how it is to do business in Africa and what the opportunities uh, there are. Uh, Mr. Mahama, the next presidential election in Ghana will be in 2024. Um, have you officially thrown your hat in the ring? Do you plan to run again? Uh, no, I haven't, Heidi. <laughs> well, you know, and, word on the street, <laughs> let me put it that way. <laughs> well, it's good to keep your opponent guessing. And so even if I'm not running, I'm not going to say I'm not running. <laughs> so um, a decision will be taken early next year in the first quarter. And uh, that's when we hold our party's primaries for the presidential candidacy, and uh, we'll see. So at this point, you say you can neither confirm nor deny? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, you know, um, turning to the situation in the country, and you have been very outspoken about the economic turmoil that you are seeing um, in Ghana. The country is enduring deep economic problems, yeah. rampant inflation. Now, of course, this is not unique to Ghana. We're seeing this globally. Um, but we saw protests in the country yeah. um, in June against yeah. the high cost of living. Yeah. Um, and you've for a long time called on the government to accept assistance from the IMF. Yeah. It has now changed course yeah. and, and um, has turned to the International Monetary Fund yeah. for help. But Mr. Mahama, you also came under fire about how you handled the economy during your tenure. Um, should you run for president? Yeah. Should you have a chance to lead your country mm. again? Mm. What would you do differently mm. that you didn't do the first time around? What would you do differently next time? I'll just, I'll just um, say something a, a, a little bit to look at the two circumstances under which we went into the IMF. Um, we are all members of the IMF, and so it's a body we go to when you have some macroeconomic instability. And so at the time I was president, yes, we suffered macroeconomic instability due to two factors, internal and external. External, you get shocked from time to time. We had the commodity price shocks the slowdown in China. But internally, we overshot our expenditures because we introduced a new wage policy that um, uh, sought to make the uh, remuneration in the public sector more uniform. And it shot the wage uh, bill far above what we had anticipated. Almost 73% of our revenues was going to pay wages and salaries alone. And so that forced us to go uh, into the IMF. Um, this government has twin problems. One is um, macroeconomic instability because expenditures far exceed revenues. Revenues are not performing properly. But then the second thing is also that they went on a borrowing spree and they've pushed our debts to, uh, le to levels that are unsustainable. Uh, just recently, the World Bank came and said we had almost 104% of debt to GDP. And so we have twin problems. One, to uh, achieve fiscal consolidation, and two, to um, uh, bring debts back to sustainable levels. So that's what they're faced with. Um, what I'll do differently, the economy is situated in an environment. It does not exist in isolation. And so there are some things that need to be done to create an environment for the economy to thrive. And some of them are governance issues, strengthening state-owned institutions, the fight against uh, 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 corruption, you know, and so many other things that create the environment for the economy to thrive. I think that if we go into this program and we bring debts back to sustainable levels and we are able to um, get the bridging facility in order to achieve policy credibility 
so that investors again feel confident that they can bring their money into Ghana, then we, we must start from there and maintain that prudence. This should be the last time we go to the IMF. I mean, because going and coming and going and coming, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, it, it creates a certain instability in the whole system. And it also reduces the faith that people have in our democracy. One of the things that we will do when we come back, that's the NDC. I didn't say I, because we're not sure who will lead us. One of the things that we'll do is to, like I said, strengthen state institutions, strengthen the anti-corruption institutions, but most importantly, look at the constitution again. We've been operating this constitution for more than 26 years, and I think that the time has come for us to look at it again and do some tweaking in order that we can have a more uh, a, a proper constitutional environment in which to grow the economy. And so those are some of the things that we we'll look at. In four years, we have a four-year term uh, like they have in the America, not like in other countries where they have five right. terms. And right. So there's very little you can do in terms of infrastructure. We'll do our best, invest in uh, the health sector, invest in education, invest in the economic infrastructure. But all this must be geared towards creating opportunities for especially young people, to be able to realize their full potential, be able to find jobs in the economy. I think that that's what, what, what we'll be looking at. And, and in your experience, does a loan from the IMF cure all economic ills? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You see, um, what happens is you can implement a homegrown fiscal consolidation policy, which is what we wanted to do. But unfortunately, a lot of local and foreign investors, you know, would probably doubt that you can live by the promises that you make. Unless you have an institution like the IMF, you know, working together with you because they know that if you have the IMF supervising, they're going to be marking and making sure that you meet the obligations that you have set out. And that is why an IMF program becomes uh, important. That's why I said it's for policy credibility. You know, once IMF comes and puts a stamp and says, look, uh, we, we accept what Ghana wants to do, and we're going to walk along with Ghana in order to be able to implement uh, this program that they have brought. Then that increases investor confidence, you know, both outside and, and, and inside, that you'll be able to achieve the things that you set out. But aside from that, IMF will give you money to show up your foreign reserves, and you need that money to stabilize your currency. And so if government is able to... Uh, reach uh, accommodation with IMF, which will be dependent on if they're able to reach agreement with our creditors because of the debt must come to sustainable levels before the IMF will give you a program. And so if they're able to do that, then the IMF will give Ghana, Ghana is looking for $3 billion. I don't know how much the IMF is going to give, but anything between $1.5 billion and $3 billion would help and show mean, up the reserves. You mean something similar to what Zambia has Yes, exactly. Our situation is similar to Zambia. Zambia had a twin problem, both the debt and fiscal consolidation. Correct. And now they've got a program. I think they have had their negotiations for Correct. debt sustainability, and I think they are well on their way now. And so Ghana is, is next. Where and they also didn't get the higher figure that they wanted, but, you know, I, <laughs> but I can I guess understand. But I guess their economy is stabilizing quite well. The Kwacha has made us one of the best performing currencies in Africa. Correct. just two days yeah. after. Unfortunately, in Africa, in, in, in Ghana, we have taken over the mantle of the worst performing currency. Not only in Africa, the world. So... Um, a part, another part of taking IMF loans is, of course, the, the conditions attached, the conditionalities, which many countries and many people in general on the African continent are always wary about. They think IMF conditionalities cuts in social spending. Would you advise um, the Ghanaian government to cut? You talked about rampant spending. To cut spending and where? What kind of spending? Um, social services? You know... People think about the IMF in the old sense of what it was. The IMF has gone through a lot of reform. They're not going to come and tell you to cut social spending. They're going to ask you to bring a program. Your revenues are much lower than your expenditure. How are you going to bring it in sync? And you have to tell them where you can cut. And so you are going to cut. They are not going to cut. You get my point? And so if you're spending too much money on something, you have to decide whether you think that is critical expenditure that you want to keep. 
And you agree with them, we're going to bring the deficit year on year down, the budget deficit down to, let's say, 6%. I'm just assuming that. What do you need to cut to attain 6% budget deficit? That's the program you have to send to the IMF. And when you send it and they agree with you, then, then that's it. But they are not going to... Before they used to impose conditionalities, you have to cut subsidies to education. You have to cut subsidies to health care. You have to do so and so. Now they don't do that. They let you determine where you want to cut. And then, um, if I have to recommend, I think the first place to cut would be the Office of the President budget to show the way that, look, I mean, if the President himself is cutting the uh, budget of Office of Government Machinery, then it means everybody must be prepared to make a sacrifice. Uh, I want to turn to some of the electoral politics that have been playing out in Ghana. Mr. Mahama, you have been in politics a long time, um, and there have now been two election cycles in 2012 and 2016 where the current president, Mr. Akufo Addo, and, and you have both respectively challenged the election results. Um, what can you say that you and your National Democratic Congress have done over the years to ensure that you know, the country has a free and fair electoral system to the extent that it instills confidence in people um, like you and others running for office that the results are the results and that you believe the results? Yeah, one of the first things you need is an independent and neutral electoral commission. And um, I believe that with the change that took place in the leadership of the commission, we don't feel confident that the commission is sufficiently independent and neutral uh, because of certain things that have happened. Um, my party has withdrawn from the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, committee because the, this current electoral commission said that body is only advisory and they don't need to take the advice of, of that body. And before we used to reach consensus in the Interparty Advisory Committee, um, we took decisions by consensus. Now what they've done is resurrect so many small parties and then as soon as anything comes for discussion, uh, they quickly say let's vote. And then they have all these parties on the side of the commission and the ruling party. and. They, they, they vote by majority and say, look, the decision is taken. And so we saw that we're wasting our time in the IPAC. And so we withdrew. There have been discussions to try and bring us back. But they let, you, you'll be surprised that it is the Electoral Commission that is reluctant to uh, um, accept those moves to let NDC come back. The Peace Council has invited them for the last eight months. The Electoral Com Commission can't find time to sit with the Peace Council and after that have a joint meeting between the two biggest parties so that we can go back to IPAC. They are not interested. And in the last election, a lot of things went wrong. On the pink sheets that we record the results, they did not make allowance for the number of people biometrically registered. And that's why when they were saying, we went to court and they said, why don't you bring your pink sheets? It would have been useless because you bring the pink sheets and there's no recording of the number of people verified. It's only when you have that recording, it must match up with the number of ballots in the box. And so if the Electoral Commission gives you a form that does not make provision for people verified, then what is the need for us putting our fingers on that verification machine? So a lot of things went wrong. We've done our postmortems. We realized that we have to go into the ring with our own referee. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, it means we must do, take advantage of, you know, the uh, uh, systems that are given for political parties to police the poll. And so it means that we must be extra vigilant at the polling station level, at the collation level, and the uh, final tally level. And so we're going to be much more vigilant than we were in the past. You know, you expect that the commission is neutral, and so there are some things you take for granted. But this time, we're not taking anything for granted. I, I use the, that metaphor because of uh, uh, one of our boxing legends, um, Azuma Nelson. He had a fight with a guy called Jack Fenech, and he lost because he thought the judges were unfair. And so when they asked him, they said, you know, what is it you're going to do different when you go into the ring? He says, I'm taking my referee along, my own referee along. And they asked him, which referee? She said, my fist. I'm going to make, once I knock him down, nobody's going to come and give a judgment, you know, that uh, he won the fight. Yeah. So um, 
Um, Mr. Mahama, I want to move on a little bit um, to a more international um, discussion. Um, a lot of the economic turmoil that we've just been talking about and that we're seeing around the world is, of course, as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. African countries have largely uh, avoided taking sides on the issue. At the United Nations, Ghana, along with Kenya and Gabon, voted to condemn um, Russia, um, but then, of course, Ghana abstained on, on the vote to remove Russia from the human, UN Human Rights Council. In your view, were those the right decisions made by the current administration? I think that the world order is changing. Uh, you remember, we had the Cold War, and um, as a result of the Cold War, developing countries formed the non-aligned movement Correct. because we didn't want to be seen to be on one side or the other. You know, I think that we're, after um, the, the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, we had a period of globalization, and so, I mean, we thought that with the nuclear dividend and more money available, the reduction in the arms race, you know, things were going to get much better. Unfortunately, it looks like we're creeping into that, that period again. Um, I think that it's a period of adversity for the whole world because it's um, triggering a kind of global recession. Uh, as a result of the tensions that have been uh, created. Um, but at the same time, it must create some opportunities for, for Africa. Um, China and Russia and uh, I don't know which other countries appear to be on one side, and then the whole Western world is also on the other side. Already um, in Africa, if we need um, funding for infrastructure, big infrastructure uh, projects, the place to go is China uh, and the East. Um, normally, the Western countries would invest in the social sector, in education, in healthcare, and things like that, but not big infrastructural uh, projects. I'll make an exception for the Millennium Compact, which uh, President Bush introduced, and which Ghana has benefited from twice. But normally, if you want to do a bridge or a road or a railway or something, often you'll go to, to the East. Um, at the last G7, um, the Western countries uh, talked about a 600 billion uh, a, a fund to assist Africa and other developing countries in terms of infrastructure. I know that the United States has put up the uh, DFC, I think it's a DFC, and they've committed about 100 billion uh, to uh, assist countries in critical you know, infrastructural projects. So, it's an opportunity for us to uh, benefit, you know, in terms of improving our infrastructure. But at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to look within and see what we can do better in terms of trading amongst ourselves. Happily, we've passed the African Continental Free Trade Area. And as I speak, the first commodities are beginning to be exchanged. Um, a shipment of tiles from Ghana, I read this morning, is going to Rwanda. And a shipment of tea is coming from Kenya. Uh, to, to Ghana. I mean, that's good news. I mean, we've been advocates of this for so long. We're happy it's happening now. 11% trained amongst ourselves. That's, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. And so we are hoping that this can push trade between ourselves even to 50% so that we're able to multiply the benefits within the continent, but also uh, get benefits from outside. Africa never got a Marshall Plan. After the war, Europe was rebuilt because America put up big money to rebuild Europe. Africa has never got that opportunity in terms of a Marshall Plan to build our economies and all that. Do you think Africa should, ha there should be a Marshall Plan? Yes, after Africa? slavery, after slavery, I think there should be a Marshall Plan. I mean, slavery affected the continent very adversely. And um, I do believe that um, if a Marshall Plan was put up, you know, and we got the right leadership on the continent, and we do the kinds of things we're doing, trading, building the infrastructure on the continent, we can create a, a decent existence for our people. I have confidence that Africa is the next you know, uh, emerging continent and is going to be the next uh, frontier for investment and business. Well, um, from what they say, from your lips to God's ears, um, <laughs> Mr. Amen. John Dramani Mahama, the former president of Ghana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. We do appreciate it very Thanks, much. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for having me.